Today, I, I want to talk to all of us about losing no sleep. Whatever it is that God has asked you to do, it's not worth losing sleep over, especially to dads who are going to feel right now great responsibilities, whether it's at work, in your marriage, in relationships. And then, of course, the big thing. You think, well, what's that? <laughs> it's making disciples. It's making sure that the good news is preached in every nation. It's the main thing that Jesus is really focused and interested in. Um, I, I want to, and I'm not sure what's happening, Pastor Caleb, but right now, I don't have anything here on the screen. Well, there we go. We got pictures here on the screen. I think I figured it out, Caleb. I think it's good. But he'll, he'll do more. He's, he is brilliant. He works so many things behind the scenes to make so many things happen. What you're seeing on the screen behind me is the future of Evergreen Church. The property that we're in right now is only one-third of the building that was planned to be built here. And when I came here as pastor in 2010, uh, one of the things I felt strongly was to finish the work that God has given us to do. Out here, you'll see beautiful green lawns. They're cared for by volunteers. And you may enjoy the green grass and all the space that the grass affords and beauty that's there. But God didn't give us that green grass just to mow it. He wants us to develop it. When I pull into the parking lot every day for the last nearly 14 years, I feel this sense of undeveloped potential, and it's my responsibility to finish what's here. Why? Because you and I live in one of the most strategic corners of our region, and you and I live in one of the most strategic parts of our nation, and one of the most strategic cities in the world. There are three hubs of tech in the world, Silicon Valley, Tel Aviv, and the third one is where, where you and I live. This strip between here and Bellevue, this is where all of the thought processes take place, not only for the technology we're familiar with, but what we're stepping into with AI. Right across the street will be one of the hubs of AI development right here in the city of Bothell, new facility being developed. You and I live smack dab in the middle of one of the most influential places in the world. And we've been given seven and a half acres for free thanks to pioneers who believed for this property, who gave generously for this property. And now we're the next generation to take it to the next stage. Very rarely does a congregation get a chance like ours has to change not just now, but decades. And if Jesus holds back, even centuries to come, because there's something about a profoundly built place of worship that shifts a culture of a whole region. This isn't just a church to reach Bothell. It's a church that will pivot our entire region. So it rains here a lot, if you haven't noticed yet. If you're new to our region, uh, just stick around. The weather's going to change. And we made a significant step in developing our property. Uh, we wanted to have a large space for public activity. So we're essentially creating what is a public park for the community, but for us, it's a place of ministry. So it's a half an acre under glass. Just think of the family activities that can take place there, as well as the outreach we do, whether it's Christmas lights or concerts or picnics or whatever we do in the community, as well as kids being able to play and all the things that engage our community. The next thing we've discovered by having our coffee shop is that so many people have overcome their fear of walking on a church property. A lot of people are apprehensive, especially in this neighborhood where many people come from many different faith backgrounds and they're scared to come onto a church property. We have Muslims and Hindus and people without any faith orientation at all coming to our building on a regular basis because the culture's coffee house. In fact, they come here on Sunday morning because they Googled or followed the Joe app and came here to buy coffee and discovered that the coffee shop has a church behind it. And some of them have started attending church as a result and so in the next development, we're going to have a restaurant in the front of our building. Uh, it'll serve breakfast and lunch. Uh, this is also part of the support of developing this project because we want a facility that has multiple income streams that helps us develop a, a facility that impacts our community. We're giving a lot of attention to kids. This is one of two 
kid playgrounds. This is the outdoor one. In a minute, you'll see the indoor play space. Uh, this will be an addition on this end of the building, adding more kids' place, play space. On this end of the building, there's going to be a youth hangout area. This isn't the actual design. This is another church, but we're learning from their design. There'll be half-court basketball, uh, get meeting space, gaming space, uh, a, a place where students can enjoy their friendships and develop relationships, and they can experience the ministry of our great youth pastor Milan and his wife Ilona. Welcome back from their wedding, and they're back into the ministry. So there's, this is back into the restaurant, and we faced a big challenge with our property. As you know, land costs a lot of money in our neighborhood. The average price of a house in this neighborhood is $1.5 million. Uh, so therefore, we had to maximize our seven and a half acres. And so our architect came, architect came up with a remarkable plan. We're going to put the auditorium underground. Hey, listen, if they could do it at Cupertino with Apple, we're going to do it here at Evergreen. So we're going to have an underground auditorium. This is the staircase that leads you downstairs. And this is looking uh, down the hallway, the elevators, of course, to get down there as well. If you notice, they created all this cool, natural light so it doesn't feel like you're underground. And this is the auditorium. It'll seat about 950 people. And the main floor has movable seating, so we can do things like alpha and all those kinds of events. Uh, and then this will also be not only a place for worship, but a place for concerts and conferences and conventions. This is going to become one of the most strategic gathering places for the body of Christ, not just now, but for decades and maybe centuries to come. Think of how many revitalizing events will take place in this facility, not just for Evergreen Church, but far beyond Evergreen Church. And then, of course, this helps us to intersect with the business community because we're, again, in the center of a business park. And we can offer a facility for business conferencing like what we do for the Chamber of Commerce this is not only a building for um, gathering space uh, that takes place on Sundays or even this fellowshipping that we're doing during the week, but this room will become a two-floor, 11-classroom school building. I don't have any drawings to show you of that yet. We're working on it. But we're going to start Compass Christian School, and in this space right here will be a place where children can be not only equipped and trained and developed and all the things that are necessary in their education, but they can also think how to follow Jesus in a really complicated age. And parents will be fully informed of everything that's happening in the lives of their kids, which is so, so important because there's a partnership between the school and the family. The result of all of this is a church that you build your life around. It's a church where you put roots down. There's a sign in our city, it's been there for generations, it says Bothell for a day or a lifetime. How about we make it a lifetime? Instead of just coming here for a little bit, that believers put down roots for the long term, that we stay in the city to transform the city. Hey, we're done fleeing to Texas and Arizona and Idaho. It's time for us to love the city of Seattle, to love the state of Washington, and to put down roots here and to grow and prosper here. Hey, come on, people. You know why I'm saying this? <laughs> darkness, darkness is trying to take over the city. And the only thing between the darkness and society is us, the radiant church, the body of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> so here's our hope. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. He grants Leap to those he loves. We're going to build something bigger than us, but not too big for God. And we're not going to lose any sleep. And dads, you're going to build your home and your family and your business and your life and your career and the Great Commission without losing any sleep. And whatever it is you're facing right now, whether it's grief or tragedy or sickness or financial loss or whatever it is you're going through, it's not worth losing any sleep. You and I need to deeply, deeply, deeply trust God. Now, those words were spoken to a young man whose father had passed away, and he was given responsibility for building the most beautiful building on earth. His name was Solomon, 
And his job was to build the temple of God. And God said to him, don't worry. Don't lose any sleep over this. God's going to build this. It's interesting in the Psalms, there's only two Psalms that have the name of Solomon attached to it. The first one is about becoming king, and the other one's about building God's house. God wants to establish you in leadership, and God wants to establish the house that you build. Not just your physical home, but the house of God. And if God builds the house, you're going to get sleep. This is based on the word that God had given to his father. David, of course, is the father of Solomon. And David has his friend Nathan over. He says, no, Nate, here I am. I live in this beautiful house. And God lives in a tent. I, you know, I, I just like to build God a beautiful home. And Nathan says, hey, Dave, just go for it. I mean, they were on first name basis. You, you just build whatever's in your heart. And then that night, God said to Nathan the prophet, I didn't say that. You go back and tell David. Hey, don't you go build in a house for me. I, I, listen, I, I don't need any help from you. I'm going to build a house for you. And then David prays this prayer, Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build a house for you. And so your servant is found courage to pray this prayer to you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are losing sleep, you need to come back to this prayer of David. It's an attitude that I will build a house for you. And sometimes stress in life is because we're trying to build a house for God. We're trying to do for God what he wants to do for us. And he can't help us until we stop doing his work does this make sense? And you let go and let God do his work. Now, there's a danger in building a house for God. You could become God's landlord. Oops. And if you don't like God, you kick him out for not paying his rent. You could easily create a church in your own image. In fact, in our society, there are many churches that are moving away from the Bible. They're moving away from biblical truth. They're moving away from truth, and they're creating God in their own image. Can I can guarantee you something? If you read this book, you're going to get your feelings hurt at some point. But I can also guarantee you that if you keep coming to this church, we're going to walk with you, we're going to love you, we're going to comfort you and encourage you and inspire you to become all that God has designed you to be. I think sometimes people stop reading the Bible because they do get their feelings hurt. But that's a proof that we don't own the house. It's the Lord's house. So is, are you trying to build God's house or is God building your house? And this is where we start is we got to say just like David, Lord, you build your house. I'm not going to do it for you. The Bible itself interprets the Bible. And after reading this scripture this last week about, I will build a house for you, I was reading in another part of the Bible in the New Testament the story of Stephen. Of course, he's being stoned for his life, thinking fast on his feet. The Holy Spirit's working through him. And he creates this incredible panorama of history of everything that God's done in human affairs. Incredible message that he gives, Acts chapter 7. And he says something very simple. He says, after receiving the tabernacle, and he goes on and explains more about Joshua and the people of Moses, but I was fixated with that phrase, after receiving the tabernacle, and I underlined it. And that's what you need to do. When you find something that really gets your attention right in your Bible, no, you're not supposed to keep it pristine, right in your Bible, put dates next to it, your notes next to it, so you come back to that, and maybe your children inherit the Bible, and they come back to it at a time of need. And I read that scripture, I got something, is that the house of God is a gift from God. We don't give God a house, he gives us a house. He gives us a home. It comes from him. That can be true of your family finances, your personal health, your career changes or advancements, a breakup of relationships, heartache and sorrow and grief, or the really big thing. You think, what's the big thing? Remember the Great Commission, go into all the world, uh, make sure that everybody gets the gospel, make sure we make disciples. That's the big thing. Are, are you receiving the house of God? 
It's a gift to us. This is significant because God has a big heart. I don't think we grasp how big it is. Because God has a big heart, he loves everybody. The house of God has to be a gift from God because God loves more people than you and I could ever afford to take care of. That's why church buildings cost so much, at least the ones that are worth building, because people matter. In in case you get your feelings hurt by what I just said, there's only one miracle of Jesus repeated in all four Gospels. What is it? The feeding of the 5,000. Why? Because people are worth the investment. And because people are worth the investment, we invest in them. And when the investment costs more than you have, God has resources beyond you, and he can even use a little boy to take care of all their needs. People matter. You know, people say to me, why does it cost so much to live here in Seattle? It's because the people who are here are incredibly valuable to God. And it's worth struggling to live here because people matter. And there are people here to meet and reach and to win to Christ. God wants to build a house that is as big as the heart that he has to reach people. One of the things I love about the plan that we have, it's all about people. Our developer, Brad Oster, has built over 200 churches nationwide. He's built more church facilities than any other developer in America. And he's so fixated on reaching people, he will not build churches for country club churches. And he won't build churches for churches who won't pray. And he says that Evergreen Church prays more than all the other churches he's ever worked with. He says that Evergreen Church is more focused on outreach than any church he's worked with. In fact, this plan has more about our neighbors than it does about us. Why? Because people really matter. And so God gives us the house as a gift. It's all from him. Um, My prayer and hope is that one day I see this house filled with people. But here's something really personal. For the last year, I've had the same dream now seven times. It's happened over and over and over again. I've written it down each time. It's the same dream over and over again. I come onto this property, and it's filled with people. Like, there are so many people, we can't manage all the people. They're running around for chairs, trying to sort things out. The other thing in the dream is, I'm not in charge. The next generation is in charge of the church. And the other thing about the dream is, I'm at the back of the room, not at the front of the room. And the younger generation are totally running the church. I have this dream over and over again. And the dream, I always wake up with the same feeling, is we have to be ready for the people that God's going to send to us. Now, here's something practical. Pastor Caleb recently preached a message about pruning for growth, which was, I felt, a profound prophetic message for our church. And so I dug into some numbers this last week. And we have these really cool graphs and metrics, this incredible software package tells us everything that's happened in the church for the last 20 years. And I was digging into what's happened pre and post pandemic, and here's what I found. Evergreen Church pre-pandemic, we grew consistently at 12% per year, every year from 2010 up to the pandemic, which in church world is lightning speed. Most churches grow about 2 to 3%. We were growing 12% every year for 12 years. And then the pandemic came, and our attendance dropped by 60%. We went down to 39% of Sunday attendance. And by the way, that's what happened everywhere nationwide. All churches restarted. And then what happened next really caught my attention. Because our growth trajectory increased from 12% to 29% post-pandemic. Now, it's not really apparent because the congregation is still coming back. And by the way, it's not the same people. It's the new people. There are renewed people. You guys are hungry. You want to see the Great Commission fulfilled. And what's happening with the church, it's like a submarine underwater, and it's doing a quick surfacing And what's going to happen at some point is the growth of the church is going to one day surprise you when you come to this campus because you won't get a parking space. You won't find a seat because the love of Jesus will keep drawing people in. What we're doing today is so important for tomorrow, even if we can't see tomorrow yet. Meanwhile, he develops us today. I got to tell you that the reality is that this is going to take years 
We have to work through the city of Bothell. We have to work through the wetlands department who are protecting salmon. We got lots of things to think about. It's going to take time, but we're doing everything we can possibly do because ultimately we've got to reach more people. So the house is a gift from God. And then you and I are called to join with God in his work, not in building his house, but building our lives. And we say, Lord, build my house, build my life. This is what Jesus said. He said, I will build my church. And then he turned to the disciples and he said, if you hear my words and you put them into practice, you're like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose The winds blew and beat against that house, and it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. When you and I build God's house, he builds our life. God doesn't live in buildings, but when people build his house, he lives in their lives because he does his work through you and I. God wants to make you and I different people. I've had the privilege of ministering to people now for over four decades. Crazy. How did I live so long? And I've watched what happens when people get really fixated with Jesus' mission, when they fall in love with their church, when they give sacrificially, when they serve in the ministries and they care about the people. What happens? They just do better. They do better in their finances, in their marriages, in their health. When they go through crisis, they rebound better. Everything seems to go better for people who align themselves with God's purposes. And that's because if you build your life on Jesus, he just takes care of all the rest. I think the key is that the building on the outside shouldn't be greater than the people on the inside. God is right now building us, the people inside, so that we are bigger than the building on the outside that we will build. Right now, what's happening at Evergreen Church is we, as a congregation, are growing. Not just in number. We are growing in faith. We're growing in maturity. Keep coming to church. One of the things that's also encouraging me, because we know from kid check-in, from those of you who check your kids in, People are coming back to church more frequently now than ever before because you are hungry and you are passionate. And this summer when you're out traveling, keep using the Evergreen Church app to keep in connection with your church because things are happening all summer long. When those food truck nights come, be here. Be involved with the 4th of July. Get involved in the ministry. Right now we need 40 more volunteers in kids' ministry. Do you know it takes 120 volunteers to care for all our kids? We have 80 volunteers. We need 40 more volunteers. Be part of what God is doing right here at Evergreen today. And then we on the inside become bigger than the church we build on the outside. When I grew up as a kid, my mom would often say, use a little phrase, you know, we can't do this or we'll end up in the poorhouse. And I always wondered, why do we always talk about the poorhouse? Until I went to Ancestry.com in my spare time and checking out the family tree, I discovered that her grandmother was raised in a poorhouse. And if you ever watched a documentary about poorhouses in Victorian England, they were not nice places to be. And obviously this created a deep angst. But the good news is that grandma, her name was Granny Boyd, got into the Presbyterian church and found Jesus and found the scriptures. I was talking to my uncle the other day. He talked about the faith of Granny Boyd and what that put into his life. Now, here's the cool thing. That church they had in Glasgow, where the family grew up, um, it later closed. But when Timothy Keller, who just went to heaven, remember Timothy Keller? He had a church planting organization that has been reawakening church planting across Scotland. So many Presbyterian churches in Scotland have moved away from the gospel, moved away from scripture. And so Keller's organization came in and began replanting churches all throughout Scotland. And they chose Granny Boyd's church in Glasgow as the base of operations. This shows the impact of one building created by faithful people over generations. You and I have no idea what's going to happen through what we invest today. When you give a gift into legacy builders now, that can be making an impact decades from now in lives of people that you and I will never meet. What our city needs is not more commercial space. 
It doesn't need another brewery. It doesn't need another place of entertainment. What our city needs are more church buildings. You're saying, why? Because people, you and I live on the east side of one of the most influential cities in America. And get this, between here and Issaquah, there's been no new church construction on a major scale since the mid-1990s. Meanwhile, over a half million people have moved into this zone. People, do you realize what that means? The church is not even keeping pace with society. And I believe the people of Evergreen Church are going to make a difference. And we're going to build a legacy that endures into the future. You say, well, I don't have enough. Don't worry about that. You need to get out of the poor house and into God's house. And get the poverty thinking out of your mind. And to realize that you have a dad who's rich. Here's the last thing is, Lord, use my life. You and I become like that little boy with his lunch. Lord, I don't have much, but I give you what I got. Use my life. Now, Solomon had messed up parents. His dad not only committed adultery, but he committed murder to cover up his infidelity. And then his older brother died as part of the judgment of God, and then Solomon is born. This kid comes with a, a murky past, and yet God chose him to build the house of God. He chooses him to become an example of a great king, one of the greatest kings of all time, richest Solomon, as we say. And this is evidence that God can use any of us. It doesn't matter what you did or what was done to you or where you were born or what zip code you came from. It doesn't matter what part of the world you came from. God can use your life. He can redeem any of us if we just say, God, use my life. And so Solomon, probably least likely to succeed, prays that desperate prayer. God, use this house. And then God speaks to him in the middle of the night. He says, Solomon, I heard your prayer. And when I shut the heavens so there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, what's going to happen next? Where are you going to go when the crisis comes? Where are your friends going to go when the crisis comes? He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Ladies and gentlemen, two well, 3,000 years later, in fact, as I speak right now, there are people above ground and below ground at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem praying day and night, night and day, day and night, night and day, day and night, night and day because of this promise. There's something profound about a place of worship that shifts a region. God used Solomon. He can use us. Casey Treat has been a real encouragement to me. And I asked him one day, I said, Casey, how'd you do it? Uh, the facility he built in Federal Way was 89 million. And Sound Transit's taking it over, making it into part of the new rail development. So they're getting a payout, they're having to move to a new location, start all over again. I said, how'd you do it? He says, I don't know. He said, but I, I just pray this little prayer, Lord, I, I, I don't have the money. And I don't know anybody who does, but you are my source. And that's just stuck in my spirit. It's helped me through a lot of things. I don't have the money. I don't know anybody who does. And that sets me free from looking to any human being, but God, you are my source. And he's surprised me over and over again. You can use that in so many parts of your life. I don't have the money. I don't know who has the money, but God, you are my source. You say, well, how do you start thinking like that? I don't think like that. Here's the key. It's in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. It says that there are two people in the house. Hebrews 4, sorry, chapter 3, verse 4. Moses was a servant of the house, but Jesus was a son of the house. You see, a servant of the house it doesn't really know if he has what it takes. But a son of the house knows that his father is rich and his father's got everything that it takes to do what's needed to be done. Are you living like a servant or are you living like a son? You see, a servant says, um, 
I, I don't have the money. I don't know anybody who has the money. I guess we can't do it. You see, if you're living with servant thinking, you're thinking thoughts too small about yourself and too small about God. But when you have son or daughter thinking, then your mind begins to grow. You say, I don't have the money. I don't know who has the money, but God is my source. Some of you on this Father's Day need to make a full dependence on God as your father, that he is your source. When you become secure that you are a son and you're a daughter of God, you can walk into all kinds of challenges of life, whether it's financial or health or marriage or situations, and just walk in with a confidence that God is my source. God can help me through. Um, in the first church that we built in Australia, we had a treasurer in our church. He was phenomenal with organizing the money, made sure every bill was paid, always put funds away. He's a great treasurer. But you can always tell when funds were running low in the ministry because he would become really edgy. And I'd get, you know, phone calls, shut off the lights, turn off the air conditioning, all those kind of things. He could be grumpy. So when money was good, he was happy. When there wasn't money, he wasn't really happy. And it was fairly stressful. I didn't always know from budget reports where we're at, but I could definitely tell by his emotional response on any given day where the church finances were. And so when we built that building that cost the cost of 11 houses, and I wasn't sure how we were going to do it, we had this gathering of the church to pray. There were probably 100, 120 people there. And he stands up with his Bible, and he starts speaking. I think, whoa, I don't know where this is going to go. Well, what happened next really shocked me. He said, I've been up all night praying. He said, God spoke to me in the middle of the night from Isaiah chapter 45, that I have treasures in darkness. And he said, I believe that God has treasures in darkness for us to pay for this church. And then he goes to work, and his boss was a believer who had a friend who lived on the other side of the country, and the friend had a major trucking business, which he had retired and sold, and he took the capital from his trucking empire and created this foundation that would lend to Christian ministries and churches like ours. And our interest, half of it went to world missions and the other went back to develop the capital fund. And with literally one phone call, he lent us everything we needed to build the church building. I don't even think we ever had a contract. And we paid him back in full because there were treasures hidden in darkness. And it gets better. His 11-year-old son is today the senior pastor of that church. And this last two years, they finished the other half of the building that my generation didn't build. And they just finished a $5 million addition for youth and children ministry. And they're paying that thing off. And I'm just so proud of him. And I think the legacy that that man left, not just of finances, but of his family building the kingdom going forward. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in a, a long-term adventure here as a body. It's not just a, a one-day wonder. Uh, but you and I are part of Jesus building his church. Meanwhile, he's going to build your life. And meanwhile, he takes your surrendered life. And I want to pray a simple prayer of blessing over you, over your family, especially this Father's Day. So if you'd be kind enough to please stand. Father, I pray for those in this room, I pray for those watching online, that wherever there is anxiety, bring faith. And I pray that that faith would be rewarded with substance of answers. And I pray that where there is lack, there would be provision. Where there is sickness, there would be healing. Where there's grief, there would be comfort. Where there's division, there would be unity. Where there is perplexity, there would be a clarity. And then, Father, we pray that you would align us as a church with what really matters to you of making disciples, of bringing the good news to every person in this city and beyond. And I pray that you would put your hand upon Evergreen Church and that you would take us to a whole new level so that we become a people through whom you can do the greater works you had in mind. You said that through us you would do greater works than Jesus himself had done. 
And so, Father, help us as a church to step up and into the great things that you have ahead for us and use all of us in this great work. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching the Evergreen Church YouTube channel. If today's message encouraged you, let us know in the comments below and share it with a friend so that they can be encouraged too. And also, don't forget to subscribe so that you'll know when we go live or post a new video. I want to invite you to be a partner with us in our ministry by giving to Evergreen Church. You can find out more details in the description below. Thank you again. May Jesus change lives through